Videos like this are made possible by the generous support of patrons like Waither. Thanks, Waither. Hello, Penguin Lords, I'm the Video Penguin, and welcome back to For All Kerbal Kind. Beginning the episode by spending some of our almost bottomless funds at this point upgrading our research speed. And because those funds are almost at sandbox levels, we have limited our research speeds to 2.5 science a day, at least for the foreseeable future. And with that, we're unlocking early life support and ISRU, which does give us a few parts, but more importantly, gives us access to the lithium hydroxide long-term carbon dioxide scrubber and also to nitrogen pressure control which is going to be very important later in the episode but in the meantime we're actually ending salyut one's mission a little bit early because its power systems simply can't keep up with the load of having three kerbals on board it's run out of power it only has a few hours of electric charge remaining and as such we are sending yuri valerie and felix home five days early which is a shame because not only do we not complete the 30 day crew duration contract, but also we don't complete the space station contract itself. Now it's not entirely a bust mission, we do complete the three crew orbital mission contract, which effectively pays not for the development of Salyut, but it pays for the launch of it and the launch of this particular Soyuz craft itself. So we haven't lost money here, we gained some experience. But unfortunately, Salyut 1 is just not up to snuff, and we need to use some more advanced space station technology, particularly advanced space station solar panel technology, which we're still researching before we launch another one of these station missions. Now, it turns out that this is actually historical. I didn't really test this because I assumed that the Salyut 1 solar panels would be balanced to be able to power all the experiments and life support aboard. Turns out they're not balanced, but that's intentional because in reality, Salyut 1 did have power problems. It never hosted a crew for more than just over 20 days, at least 23 days or so, and it didn't have enough power to run its experiments and its life support at the same time. It was rushed into orbit to beat the Americans to getting the first space station into orbit, and it used basically spare Soyuz parts as well as parts of the Almaz military space station contract. Now you can actually expect the next few stations that we will be launching will be of the Almaz type, although of course we will still classify them as Salyut stations to disguise their true intentions from those pesky Americans. But I've spent a while configuring the space stations and adding uh, photography experiments to them so we can actually use them as crewed spy satellites. You see our crew landing safely in the Russian tundra and arriving back on Earth. We do get a little bit of science as well, and as I said, we complete that contract, but unfortunately that lucrative first space station contract and crew duration contracts elude us for now. But we are going to have to deorbit Salyut 1 because it's not capable of hosting a crew, it's just going to turn into a very large uncontrolled piece of space debris, so we might as well perform a controlled deorbit into the Pacific Ocean. With the highly successful first launch of the UR200 in the last episode, we're launching another one with yet another geostationary weather satellite contract. Now there is probably a limit to the number of these that we can complete as each time you repeat it, you have to heft a bit more payload into the orbit. But this was actually a test to see whether we could do that without using a bioelectric transfer, which we used in the previous episode. That's the more efficient transfer in which you have a massive apoapsis and you fly way further out than you need to go. Then you do your inclination change there and then you perform another burn as you return back to your target orbit. So you, you transfer to your target orbit via two elliptic orbits, hence the name of the maneuver, which of course I learnt during my degree, which is now finished. I, in fact, just got my results and I've graduated with a master's in spacecraft engineering with first class honors. So not too bad though I say so myself, just found a place to live and I'm going to start my new job in September. So all very exciting, it's all happening. The thing about getting a job is I'm gonna have regular hours. It's gonna be 
I was going to say 9 to 5. It's actually 8 to 5 Monday to Thursday, and then I get a half day on Friday. But outside of that, my time is my own. Whereas at uni, you've always got coursework, particularly this last year we had the group design project, which we built a Venus rover in, which will have its own dedicated video soon, I promise. I just want to wait until I get my results before I showed some of the shenanigans <laughs> that went on while we worked on that project. But you always have something you can be doing and you always have deadlines and you're working in the evening, you're working at the weekends. You can never schedule time in for hobbies or for YouTube videos. So I just had to make them as and when I could and that's really not very good for me. I need to really set aside a couple of hours to sort of get into the groove of things and actually have a productive time making something. I can't just chip away at it 20 minutes here, 20 minutes there. It takes 20 minutes just to open the game with this many mods. So even though I'm technically going to be busier, I think it's going to be a lot easier to, if not have more frequent uploads, but definitely much more regular uploads. We'll see if we can maintain the current release schedule for all couple kind. We're just going to have to wait and see until I start, and then I'll just see how much time I have and whether or not I can churn out videos. But you might need to get used to slightly shorter for all couple kind episodes, what with myself and N9 being really very busy. Episodes much like this, 15 to 20 minutes, but I really would like to maintain the two week release cadence. I think anything longer than that, and it sort of causes people to drop off the series, and that's fair enough. Regardless, we get into our orbit just fine, get our payday, and then we're launching another N1. What's going on, Biddy? You said that the last episode was the final N1. Well, I said the last episode was the final crude N1 launch. In fact, something came to my attention as I finished the previous episode, and that was that we had a Venus transfer window opening up. And I thought about it, and then N9 requested that we add the transfer window planner mod. So I took my degree in spacecraft engineering, and I <laughs> used the transfer window planner, and sure enough, it's feasible. A crude Venus flyby. Now people have been requesting this and requesting this. Everyone's been saying Apollo, Venus, and the Soviet concept was actually called TMK. And I don't think anyone, especially not N9, I think this is going to blow his mind a little bit, thought that we'd be able to do this quite this soon. A little ignition failure on the end, one second stage there, but thankfully we're able to relight it just fine. Now this doesn't have crew aboard. This is the first of two modules. This is the drive section and it has a hundred tons of fuel and supplies. Now the supplies are contained in that little service module that's docked on the front there but once we actually fuel up the main spacecraft that's going to be undocked and then we'll just connect this drive section which contains a boost engine which is only used in low earth orbit and then a coast engine with that ever reliable RD58M engine, which will be used for just kicking us the final few hundreds of meters a second out to Venus and then providing our course corrections along the way. And we're going to slingshot past Venus and then back to Earth. So, all in all, it's about an 18 month trip, and I had to spend hours designing this trajectory and figuring out if this is possible and then designing the spacecraft which is why this episode is a little bit on the shorter side because this took so long to figure out i went through so many iterations the original design actually was built around one of the later salute station designs because i thought it looked cool and much closer to the actual tmk design but the actual tmk was 75 tons and that's once it was already on its way and it was planned to use nuclear electric propulsion and we just don't don't have that kind of launch capability, enough time to launch enough N1s to assemble that in orbit. In fact, we even had to rush build that N1 a little bit, which we can do because it didn't have crew on it. If a mission is launching with crew, you can't rush build it. That's one of our little rules. But since we're launching the crew on a UR500, as you can see, we are able to get away with rush building that and just about getting this all built and launched not actually quite in time for the transfer window but about a week or two afterwards but with a little bit of extra fuel that doesn't really matter and you'll see this is the Ragatka spacecraft Ragatka of course translating to slingshot 
And aboard we have Constantine and Millie Kerman. Now you remember Millie is actually a cosmonaut from the Republic of Cuba, named by Jordan Millwood, who we introduced in the last episode and had a short flight aboard a Soyuz. Well, Millie is now going on a much, much longer adventure. 18 months in deep space. This is a very risky mission. We've got a fair bit of leeway on the life support and on the Delta V. Not as big a margin as I would like, but it's all very feasible. But there is, of course, still a very real risk. If there is a solar storm, particularly a solar flare towards the spacecraft, they will survive but they don't have any shielding. They'll have to use the fuel of the spacecraft and shelter in the VA capsule right at the top of the spacecraft. And that isn't going to be perfect. It'll reduce their dosage so it won't be lethal, but if they do get exposed to a solar flare, this is probably going to be their last mission. But Constantine, of course, is an engineer because he's gonna have to keep the ship running on his own for 18 months. And we just could not provide enough life support for three Kerbals to make this journey. So no pilot, but really they're not actually going to be flying. They're going to be launched onto a trajectory that's just going to swing them past Venus and back to Earth again with a few corrections along the way. No fancy flying really needed. It's all going to be pre-programmed and then guided from mission control. Millie, of course, going to be in charge of navigating using the stars and checking their position because they're going to have to make sure they don't get lost and then, well, they have to cope with phenomena such as radiation pressure and gravitational perturbations. Of course, they wouldn't actually have to deal with that in Kerbal Space Program, but in reality, those are very, very real things you have to correct for. Now, this is actually the first time we've launched crew on a UR500, and that's never happened in reality. There were plans to do it with the VA capsule you can see at the top of the spacecraft and the associated TKS spacecraft, which would have resupplied and expanded the Almaz military space station. Now, that spacecraft was tested and docked to Salyut 7, amongst other things, but never had crew aboard, and I don't think they ever trusted the Proton rocket in reality to carry crew. You'll notice the TKS spacecraft usually has an abort motor and a massive RCS block on the front of the capsule. Uh, we omitted that because, well, we simply couldn't afford the mass and, well, we didn't really need it. That's for the TKS spacecraft, whereas this Ragatka just needed the VA capsule because the sort of gumdrop shaped capsule of the Soyuz simply can't survive re-entry at the kind of velocities we're going to be returning to the Earth, whereas a conical capsule can. It's blunter and it creates a sort of shock wave which is separated further from the spacecraft body and just shields it a little bit better, as well as creating a bit more lift and reducing the g-forces on the capsule. So the capsule itself doesn't actually have a separate heat shield part. It's actually strangely designed for these kinds of re-entries, which is strange because it was only really designed for low earth orbit as far as I'm aware, but the part itself contains the heat shield, it's all just one part, and it's handily able to survive a re-entry from interplanetary space, so that's what we are using. Even the lunar adapted Soyuz descent module wasn't capable of cutting it. I think yeah, those of you who watched the lunar landing live stream will remember our heat shield actually burnt off returning from the moon. We cut that very, very fine, so really you couldn't have any more velocity entering the atmosphere than we did then. So now we've docked, it's time for Constantine to don his spacesuit and head out as you connect the resource transfer stations that will allow us to pump not only the water and fuel but also food from that service module there into the main spacecraft which of course is capable of free flying it's just connected to a bunch of boost stages because we need so much delta v to get us out to venus but once we're on the trajectory and we've performed a few course corrections and then our burn at venus itself we'll detach and then this spacecraft that you see that we launched on the Yakov booster will fly on its own all the way back to Earth. So not only does it have science experiments and the associated life support 
that we actually researched at the beginning of the episode, particularly that nitrogen pressure controller allowing them to take their spacesuits off, which is a big deal, which makes them much, much more comfortable and stops them from going crazy. They also have a treadmill, which is new, and a bunch of other amenities that will keep them sane for the 18-month trip. So they're going to have to be doing a pretty pretty intensive exercise regime to make sure they don't waste away but well we don't even know that that's much of a thing at this point we haven't had a crew in space for more than 25 days so this is a bit bananas uh, to be doing this quite this early i didn't expect to be doing this early but the next transfer window to mars or venus isn't for years isn't for about two years time so we do it now or we wait until N9 has plenty of warning to build a Saturn V or any of its derivatives to do this kind of mission as well. And so I knew this was our one chance to do this mission at a time when we know N9 isn't going to be capable of doing something similar. I don't think his next, I should say, Catan V is going to be ready until about February in the next year in 1966 and those of course will be allocated to further lunar exploration now we of course aren't only doing any further lunar exploration until we get the n2 so we're really just twiddling our thumbs and i wondered well what's a big flagship mission that's really going to dunk on the americans and of course this is only made possible by collaboration between the kaputnik design bureau and the shalomi design bureau which of course never happened in reality of course kaputnik didn't exist but sergey korolev's design bureau never collaborated with the Shalomi Bureau that designed the Proton, of course only when they had to. They designed a spacecraft that needed the associated rocket, but the design bureaus were always in competition with each other, which is actually in stark contrast to the very centrally managed US program. But what if they were very, very closely knit and they work together and missions like this were made possible by collaboration between their different launch systems rather than made impossible by endless competition and scheming between them well maybe we would have seen missions like the tmk of course tmk was predicated on the n1 being a success and in fact the n1 was designed for those kind of missions it wasn't actually designed for a moon landing and it was adapted for that later on and made a little bit bigger and had a few more engines added onto it. But as you can see, we've completed our burn to Venus. We've detached the first stage with one of the upper stage engines of the N1 on it, actually. In fact, the same engine that performs our TLI burn when we send crew to the moon. And now our crew set in for the 18 month journey ahead of them. But we'll join Constantine and Millie in the next episode, which won't be for a month because myself and Trent are both going on holiday. But in two weeks time, you can look forward to Carnassus video and you'll see what the Commonwealth Space Commission has been up to in 1965. Thank you very much for watching, everyone. I've been the Biddy Penguin and I will see you all next time. A massive thank you to my patrons and donators for their generous support. And an extra special thank you to The Amazing Steak, Dakota Clark, Olaf Hammerhand, Peter Lushtinets, Lady Lagzalot, Madzor, Simone67, Scott Milligan, Jesse Smith, NX74656, Jordan Millwood and Darth Malakor.